All right, let me introduce Yaron Brook. He is the host of the Yaron Brook Show. He's an author of a number of books. He is also chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute's Board of Directors. Yaron Brook, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ilan. Um, this is exciting. Yeah, but this, was... is, uh, this is great. It's great to see so many people online. It's great to see so many people from so many different countries. So uh, welcome, everybody, and, uh, and thanks, uh, thanks for being here. All right, so today, what I want to do is talk about the implication of this radical view in ethics in politics, which is the study of how we, how we build societies when we all come together, when we interact with one another. Ethics is primarily about how we live our lives, about ourselves. And ethics applies, certainly it applies in every circumstances. It applies in your day-to-day -day life, it applies in every decision you make, it applies on a desert island, and it applies when you're interacting with other human beings. Politics is the application of that ethics, the application of an ethics to how we interact in a social context. Uh, so let me, let me start by, by, uh, by, by doing it this way. You know, a lot of people, uh, uh, I think intrigued and confused and bewildered by the popularity these days of socialism. Um, you know, Bernie Sanders, even though he's not doing as well as some expected, is, is a self avowed socialist and is doing quite well. Uh, AOC, you've got lots of politicians out there who are advocating socialism and generally among young people, not just, uh, thanks for reminding me to take that off, uh, although when Q&A starts, I'll have to put it back on. Uh, it's not just in politics. Uh, you know, we have uh, academics at universities, we have uh, socialist student clubs, we have a vast, you know, somewhat bewildering popularity of a political ideology that everywhere and to the extent that it is tried has failed. And, and I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna give you another history of socialism. I'm just gonna assume that you understand that it's failed, that it is, a unsuccessful political ideology, wherever and whenever, and to the extent that it is tried, it to that extent fails. And yet, and it's incredibly popular. And it's not even that the people who advocate for this idea say, deny that it has failed. What they typically say is, but, but next time we, we, we can actually do it better. We can do it right next time. And, and, and it's, it's bewildering to most of us because, well, wait a minute, you, you've tried it a hundred times. You've tried it a thousand times. You've tried it in so many different variations, so many different places, and it fails. Why, why does this idea still have such a strong appeal on people, primarily the young? And I think if you don't understand the relationship between ethics and politics, this is truly bewildering, and this is truly a mystery, and this is hard to understand. But let's think for a moment about the ethic that is dominant in our culture. And Ankar and Ilan have talked about this. The ethic that's dominant in the culture is an ethics of otherism. It's an ethic of altruism. It's an ethic of, that says that the purpose in life, the ethical purpose in life, is other people, that virtue, nobility, morality, being a good person entails being selfless, entails sacrificing, and, and sacrificing being the idea of giving up a value for and getting nothing or something less valuable in return. So being worse off, that's what a sacrifice is. It means being worse off. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a sacrifice. It would be more like an investment. If you're going to be better off in the future because of what you do now, that's not a sacrifice. The whole idea of a sacrifice is that you are worse off, that you're taking a step backwards. And backwards from what? Backwards from life, backwards from your values. So we live in a world in which the popular common ideology is that of sacrifice, that of selflessness. And particularly among the young who tend to be idealistic about their morality, 
tend to want to apply their morality more consistently, tend to believe that they can build a world based on their morality. So they tend to be idealistic. Well, they want to take this morality of altruism, of caring for others, of placing the well-being of others above their own well-being, a morality of selflessness. They want to take that and manifest it politically. They want to manifest it in how we relate to one another because the morality is all about how we relate to one another. And of course, the political ideology most consistent with such a morality is socialism. I mean, what does socialism advocate? It advocates sacrificing those who have for those who haven't. Well, that makes sense. We should be focused on the well-being of others and, and who, who needs to be focused on the most. Well, those who have the least, those who are the most needy. And sacrifice is noble, sacrifice is good. So it's okay to sacrifice some, particularly people who are so-called privileged, I hate that word, for the sake of those who do not have anything. So sacrifice is built into socialism. And sacrifice is a moral, noble, beautiful thing. So how could we be against it? Socialism is about the good of society, the public good, the good of everybody. Not you, not specifically an individual, but some amorphous group, some undefined entity called the public. Well, that's great. That's, that's non-selfish. That's non-self-interested. That's selfless. That's them. I can focus on them. That's good. And again, if I have to sacrifice for that, if I have to pay higher taxes or not be able to pursue my values and not be able to pursue my profession or not be able to do what I really want to do with my life, that's okay because this is what virtue requires. This is what morality demands. And of course, altruism because it emphasizes the idea of selflessness. It undermines the idea of, and Ankar talked about this, of, of self-esteem, of self-confidence, of, of, of the efficacy of your own mind. Then who knows what's good for the group, for the other, for the public? I, you know, I don't know, and why would I trust my mind? And that, that would be really selfish if I just relied on my own reason to determine what's good for others. And that, of course, leaves one susceptible to the expert, the philosopher king, the, 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 the elite, that, the elitist that is going to tell me, well, this is the sacrifices we need. This is what is good for the common. This is what is good for others. This is how you should sacrifice. So to the extent that a culture takes its altruism seriously, and particularly to the extent that Young people want to be idealistic and take that morality seriously. And to the extent that that culture is altruistic, to that extent, it'll be socialist. I mean, indeed, I think the, 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 the puzzle and, and the, the, the thing that should amaze us is that we're not even more socialist than we are. And that, I think, is, as an aside, credit to our founding fathers and the spirit they created in America, which is very anti-altruism in spite of this. So there's a battle between a certain spirit of individualism, a certain spirit of the pursuit of happiness, a certain spirit of self-interest, which is reflected in our business lives, which is reflected in kind of the, the self-help attitude that most Americans have. They want to be better. They want to be happy. Clashing with our morality. If we just relied on morality, we would really be socialists. But Ayn Rand presents a completely different moral view. And what I want to do now is talk about what kind of political system that moral view necessitates. So that if our spirit, if for whatever reason we believe capitalism is good and socialism is bad, the only way we can fight, in my view, for capitalism is by rejecting altruism and adopting this moral code that Ayn Rand articulates. Because it is the only moral code. It is the only moral foundation for this system of capitalism. And let's, let's see why that is and, and how that is. Well, we've talked about this idea of, 
of living your life based on your own reason in pursuit of your own values, in pursuit of the values you deem necessary for your survival, for your thriving, for your flourishing, ultimately for your happiness. It is your judgment, your mind, which is your tool for living life. This is foundational to Ayn Rand's view of self-interest. Reason is a cardinal value. Rationality is the integrating virtue. We just had Elon explain that. So to live well, to live as a human being, but even just to survive, we must use our rational faculty. We must use our mind. I mean, in, in, when I have live audiences, I would typically tell you to look around the room and, uh, and uh, observe. You, you can't do that right now, but maybe, maybe there are other people around you where you are, and, and just observe what a pathetic animal we are physically. How physically, from a purely materialistic perspective, we couldn't survive. We, we couldn't have beaten the saber-toothed tiger. We couldn't have hunted the bison. We couldn't have eaten. We couldn't have survived at the most basic level if we just relied on our physicality. From really the beginning of mankind, we have needed to rely on our minds. As Leonard Peikoff puts it, reason is our basic means of survival. We cannot survive without using reason. We cannot hunt. We cannot build tools. We cannot agriculture, cannot do agriculture. All of those require thinking, never mind using Zoom and video conferencing, a, a, uh, a seminar across the world in lifetime with people participating and you know multiple speakers and multiple... I mean, inconceivable to people even just a few decades ago and now just a, a relatively trivial thing. All of that requires the use of the human mind. So man's life requires thinking. Man's life requires reasoning. It requires an independent mind, the ability to observe facts of reality, integrate them, and discover knowledge, discover truths. But that requires something once we get into a social context, once we have other people to deal with. Because what can other people do to us that can actually restrain our ability to think, restrain our ability to be an independent thinker, to actually look out into the world, to discover truth, to articulate truth, and then to act on those truths? What is an impediment? What is the one thing that can actually stop us from thinking, or at least make thinking so painful, so futile, that we lose all motivation to do it? What can other people do to us to restrict the ability to pursue the one value necessary for our own survival? Well, the one thing they can do is they can put a gun to our heads, tell us to obey, tell us to follow orders, tell us to ignore our own thinking. Think of Galileo's house arrest. What did that do to Galileo's mind? Did he go into that house arrest fully motivated to discover new truths in physics, to publish them and articulate them and teach us all? No. If he continued to do that, he risked being burnt at the stake. His books would have been burnt. There would have been no way for him to communicate with the rest of us. A gun had been placed to his head, the equivalent of a gun. And not only did it silence his hand in writing or silence his voice, but it silenced his mind. He went into that room or that house or wherever it was under house arrest and how do you motivate yourself to think new thoughts, to discover new truths when 
You can articulate them. And if you do, you risk death. If you're interested as a young scientist out there in exploring life extension technologies, how to allow human beings today to live to be 150 or maybe older. There's a lot of interesting, fascinating science going on looking at this. <coughs> but the government today says, we're not interested in that kind of science. We're not interested in your product. We're not interested in your discoveries around that kind of science. And without our approval, without our stamp of approval, you can't market them. You can't sell them. You can't bring them to market. You can't turn it into a business. Called regulation, the FDA. How many people are going to let their minds, are going to focus their minds on that issue? How motivated can you be when you know it's a dead end? Because even if you make a discovery, nobody's going to let you actually be able to get it out there into the world, to get a product, to sell a product, and put aside making the money. It's more about the ability to change the world. Regulations shrink the scope of our thinking because they are forced, because they tell us you cannot go there, you cannot do that. So the thing that restricts the human mind, that makes human thinking, our ability to think futile, meaningless, is force, coercion, an authority with a gun, an authority with the ability to impose itself on all of us. So if you care about your own life, if you're truly selfish, and importantly, because you care about your own life, you care about your own mind, you care about your ability to think, to independently think, often to think differently than other people, to, 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 to disagree. And then to be able to take those thoughts and apply them in reality, whether in business, whether in writing a book, whether in who you want as a friend or a lover, you want to use your mind and act on your rational thoughts, your rational conclusions. If you value that, then you recognize that the true enemy, your true enemy, is in a social context, other people trying to force other people trying to coerce you, other people trying to impose their views on you. I mean, they can argue, we can debate, we can disagree, but once you pull out a gun, once you make a fist, I am silenced. My life is in real jeopardy. So for Ayn Rand, the most important The most important idea that of, of social interaction is that force be excluded. And look, before, before I elaborate on that, I think it's important to say that Rand's individualism, Rand's selfishness is not about isolation. It's not about going living on a desert island or in some forest all by yourself and producing your own food. And No. Other human beings are massive value to us. They produce products that are hugely beneficial to our lives. Whether it's works of art, whether it's iPhones, whether it's books, whether it's food. I don't want to have to go out and raise my own food. I like that food comes from the supermarket. And the way in which we most benefit from interacting with other human beings is by letting them live their lives, by letting them think for themselves, by letting them use their minds to live the best life for themselves, hopefully producing values necessary for their survival, and that some of those values are valuable to me as well, and then interacting with them through trade whether it be material or spiritual, through voluntary transactions, through voluntary trade. 
That is the appropriate way for human beings to live in a civilized society. That is the only way we can maximize the benefits of living in such a society. And it is the only way a truly selfish human being wants to live. A desert island is a huge sacrifice. So we want to live in society, but we understand that the one thing we need to eliminate from society is force. And for that, for that purpose, we institute government. Government is a human institution. And the purpose of this institution, according to Rand, is to be the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force. A government that doesn't initiate violence, never initiates force, does not coerce, does not serve as an authority. Other than it only uses force. It only is coercive. as an act of self-defense, to protect my freedom. Now, we have a concept, and it's a concept that, you know, it, it comes out of the Enlightenment, comes out of Enlightenment philosophy, but I think Ayn Rand sharpens its definition. We have a concept to capture this idea that in a civilized society, and in a civilized society, force, coercion, authority should be eliminated, should be extracted. That concept is the concept of individual rights. Now, rights are a moral idea. They're an idea about how an individual should live his life. They basically say the way an individual should live his life is in pursuit of his own values, using his own mind. And the only way to do that is if he's free. Rights, to quote Ayn Rand, right is a moral principle, defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context. Basically says, and, and Rand points out that there's only really one right, which is the right to life, the right to take the actions necessary for you to live your life, using your mind, free of coercion, free of force, free of authority. So in that sense, rights are more sanction of a positive. You know, people talk about negative rights, positive rights, which I think confuses it all. It's the idea, to quote Rand, that you are free to act on your own judgment for your own goals by your own voluntary, uncoerced choices. And the role of government, the only role of government, according to Rand, is to protect that freedom, to protect your rights. So notice that Rand doesn't come at government from the perspective of what's good for society, what's good for the public, what's good for the common. She starts with the individual. She starts what's necessary for the individual, for his own survival, for his own thriving, for his own flourishing. She starts with happiness, in a sense, with man's pursuit of happiness, and asks the question, what kind of social structure, what kind of government, what kind of political system do we need to facilitate this pursuit of happiness, to make it possible for individuals to pursue their happiness, not to guarantee happiness, not to guarantee the most happiness for the most people, but to guarantee you the freedom to pursue your happiness. And that is the system of individual rights. That is capitalism. Capitalism which is a political, social, economic system in which the role of government is limited to the protection of individual rights, primarily property rights, but individual rights broadly, where the government has no involvement in the economy, where there is a true separation 
of economics and politics. So it's not a question, you know, we've got a million questions right now. What should the Fed do about the, you know, the economy and should it raise interest rates or low interest rates? In a true capitalist society, there is no Fed. There is no central planner to make these kind of calls, to make these kind of decisions. The only role of government is to protect you from people trying to steal from you, trying to defraud you. The only role of government is to protect you, to protect your property. So capitalism is not what we have today. I think this is important to know because people are so confused. We don't have capitalism today. What we have today is a mixed economy with some elements of freedom. We're still free in certain realms and certain parts of our lives, somewhat ever shrinking amount of freedom. And a lot of government intervention, a lot of what you might call socialism or just statism. The state is involved in regulating almost every aspect of our business lives, many aspects of our personal lives. What we have today and the world out there that is constantly being evaluated is not capitalism. The problems that occur out in the world right now are not problems of capitalism. They can be because it's not a capitalist world. It's a statist world. It's not quite a communist world. It's not quite even a fully socialist world. But it is a world dominated by statism, dominated by government intervention, where individual freedom, where the ability of the individual to flourish, where the ability of the individual to make decisions for himself, to think for himself and to act for himself, are limited and restricted. So if we care about capitalism, which I think a lot of people come to Ayn Rand, not everybody, but a lot of people come to Ayn Rand because they share this idea of political freedom, particularly in the United States. Maybe they admire the founding fathers. Maybe they have a huge respect for American history and, and the achievement that has been America because of those elements of freedom that have existed in American society. This freedom cannot be sustained. This capitalism cannot, whatever elements of capitalism still remain in America, cannot last under the assault of altruism. And we cannot move towards greater freedom, towards true capitalism, towards a truly free world without rejecting, completely rejecting the morality of altruism and replacing it with something positive because it's not enough just to be against something. One has to be for something. And as I said at the beginning, the only moral code consistent with freedom, consistent with capitalism, consistent with the idea that each individual has an inalienable right to pursue the values necessary for his own life using his own mind. The only morality consistent with that is objectivism. It's the idea of rational self-interest, the idea of selfishness, the virtue of selfishness. Freedom depends on our embracing an alternative moral ideal, a moral ideal that is about freedom. It wouldn't be a beautiful thing if people, people you know, embraced a, a true moral ideal of freedom and advocated for and fought for and were passionate about their own individual freedom and the social system, capitalism, that makes such freedom possible. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there. We could go on for quite a bit, but I know there were a lot of questions, so I'm going to allow us to move into, a, into the question period. I don't know. How do, how do we do this, Elon? How do we do the questions? Hey, you're on. So Ankar is going to join for this Q&A. We have a spreadsheet we're going to uh, pick from. We have lots of questions. You're right. I'm glad you allowed space for it. Ankar, do you want to uh, pick some out? 
Uh, sure. Yeah, I can do that. Um, oh, you have the spreadsheet. I don't see it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's take a, um, one from the Philly attendees who uh, we had to cancel on. So, uh, and this is, it's, it's about thinking about your life in a society, in a culture. So the question is, how do you adjust your expectations of what's possible to you based on the, the culture you're in or changes, the trends in the culture without becoming a victim to that sort of, you're just succumbing to what's happening in the culture? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it's, it's a, it's, it, it combines both, I think it's a lot, a lot of it is kind of a, a psychological, a psychological issue. I think you have to be objective about what is possible. You have to look at the reality as it is, look at facts, and don't let yourself become overwhelmed by the negativity. Look at the opportunities and the positivity. I mean, in spite of how bad things are, and they are bad, um, one you know, approach you could take is thinking about the fact that this you still have more opportunities today than you've had with a few exceptions here and there over history, in all of human history, 100,000 years. There's been a few moments in history, maybe the late 19th century, maybe uh, parts of the 20th century, where you've had more opportunities than today. But it's still, relatively speaking, amazingly free. Don't let the fact that you know what the potential is cause you to be so depressed that you can't take advantage of the opportunities as they exist today. Now, there are certain professions in which this is much harder than other professions, and, and, and that's just a reality that you have to accept, and it's part of, part of you know, approaching career choice objectively. It's part of approaching how you're going to pursue your values objectively. I don't know. If you're, if you're an artist, it is probably harder today than it was certainly 100 years ago uh, to pursue your arts because the, the cultural... The culture is so corrupt in terms of the art that it likes. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur in certain fields, I mentioned life extension. Um, there are lots of other fields. Uh, and I'd say here, particularly if you're poor, I think the state uh, has limited your possibilities, your opportunities even more than if, you, you know, if you're starting out in a decent, decent position with, with decent opportunities. Um, but what choice do you have other than to be as ambitious as you can within the context of what is possible to you and at the same time fight to increase your freedom. So I'd say those are the two things I would focus on. One, I'm going to find my passion. I'm going to be as ambitious as I would ever do. I know it's going to be harder. I know it's a greater challenge. But what option is there? Uh, and make the most of what, what is available to me. And then at the same time, fight for the kind of world I believe in. I, I don't think you can do it without the fighting. You need the, you need the kind of fight for the world, just for your, I think, for your sanity. You need to be able to, 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 to express yourself to, and to, to project the image of the kind of world you would like to see um, replace the world we live in. You want to add something, Yanko? Um, I just say one, it's easy to think of the culture as monolithic. So you are putting it as different industries, but there's also different countries. Yes. And you have to be willing to move and relocate. Like So life extension, it's not the same regulations everywhere. So you might have to set up a company and move if that's really what your passion is. I mean, we're both, we've left the countries we were born in. And, um, and if people want to understand why Anka and I and you probably know this more about me than Ankar, are so passionate about immigration and about having as free as immigration as we can. It's exactly this point. Um, to deny an ambitious young person the ability to move to a place where they can live their life, can actually pursue their values in a world where you can't do it fully anywhere, but to to, to deny them the ability to, to go from a hellhole to a place with relative freedom, that is such an evil in my view that, you know, it's, it's what motivates me to be so passionate about immigration. And somebody who did it, 
uh, and didn't move from hellhole, moved from pretty, and Ankar did as well, from a pretty good place to an even better place. I only imagine what it's like if you live in a hellhole to, to suddenly pull, pull up walls to prevent you from moving. So um, anybody who values the, the human potential, values the human mind, values um, the ability of human beings, you've got to be pro-immigration. The, the details we can get to in mixed economy and all of that, but the, the essential characteristic of being pro-immigration, I don't think is negotiable. Um, so we have another one from Philly, but I'll, we'll get to it. But uh, I want to bring in another question that's related. It's sort of a different angle on the same thing, but it also relates, maybe not obviously, but it relates to the egalitarian issue. Um, and it's how would Rand's, and this is now quoting the, the, the saying, that her pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality manifest itself on a large scale. Well, I'm not exactly sure what it mean, meant by a large scale, but I think part of it, it, it it's meant, can everybody do it? Is yep. this only for some people? And then the pull yourself up by your bootstrap. If you take that seriously, it means I did it alone. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so okay. So those are two issues. So one is, can everybody do it? The answer is basically yes. So the, it's true that certain people are born let's say with, with real cognitive problems or real physical problems, maybe you can't, and they're dependent on others. But that is a, that is a tiny fraction of the population. It, it is way less than 1%. An overwhelming majority of human beings can take care of themselves, can be ambitious, can live a good life. Not all can become uh, Isaac Newtons. Uh, not everybody can become a Steve Jobs. But in whatever, whatever the scope of your ability, you can be the best that you can be. You can uh, exercise your faculty to the maximum. You can be an independent thinker in, in your life, in the pursuit of your values. So, yes, everybody can do it. And, and the point about a large scale, the other angle of a large scale is, what Rand cares about and what Rand is focused on is on individuals, on every individual. And yes, if you add them all up, you get a grand scale. But she doesn't look at it and say, you know, for the public, for society. She looks at it, can an individual uh, determine their own life? Can an individual um, uh, choose their own values, shape their own values, and pursue them and achieve them? And yes, everybody has that potential, but it requires effort. It requires focus. It requires using your mind. And it, it's not automatic, which is key, right? It, it, it's not, and this is why when you look around, you see, oh, but look, millions of people don't do this. That, that is true. Millions of people don't do this. Maybe a majority of people don't do it. And, but you have to ask the question, why? Is it because they're programmed that way? Is it inevitable that they're not, are they incapable of it? And Rand's question, uh, answer is unequivocally no. It's not because they're programmed that way. It's not because they're not capable of it. It's because they chose not to do it for whatever reason. It's within their power to choose differently. It's within their power to change and it's within their power to engage that faculty of reason uh, in pursuit of their own values. So that was the first point. And then the second point is alone. I mean, there's a sense in which it's alone and that sense is that you have to engage your mind, your reason. Nobody can do that for you. Nobody can turn it on for you. You have to choose to want to, to think, to value, and to pursue those values. But then from that point is everything that you do alone. It goes back to my desert island thing. Well, of course not. You know, you've got parents, you've got teachers, you've got friends, you've got people who are trading with you with values, a variety of different values. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it, achieving something doesn't mean you achieved every single element of it. You achieve what you achieve. You achieve what you contributed to the creation of whatever it is, right? But in a social context, you benefit enormously from cooperating with other people, trading with other people. Uh, and, and working with other people to achieve 
your values and whatever values you share with them. Yeah, and part of the reason I brought it up and put it in that context is this is a common argument today that it's you get the um, if you if you say you've achieved something or somebody says I've achieved something, it's well, someone paid for the roads you drove on to work and someone paid for the school where you were an elementary kid and got educated. So so what do you mean you did it? And it's it it equivocates between you did everything and what you did was essentially you yep. um, and you made choices and you did something. And in that sense, you did it alone. Uh, and this, so, and it's often they'll put it's, well, did you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? And that means like literally go from zero to you're an adult and you did it all. Nobody taught you how to read or speak and so on. And of course that was manifest in Obama's famous speech. You, you didn't build that, you know, yeah. and, and, um, Elizabeth Warren and, specializes in it. Yeah, so he got it from Elizabeth Warren. She was even before that. And, and the idea is you, you had great teachers, you, you drove on roads, you, and, and all of that is true. You did have great teachers. You know? and, and, but that's not what it means to build something. It doesn't mean I did everything. Literally, I, I went out and went to the quarry and cut up the rock to make the concrete to, to, to build the building. I mean, that is absurd. Um, and, of course, everyone on the, call it a supply chain, of everybody's talking about supply chains these days, supply chains of the creation of this value. It, it, justice demands that everybody in that supply chain gets uh, compensated according to what they contribute to whatever it is that is being created. So in a sense, every single one of those people built that. They built whatever their portion is in building the thing that is being built and they all get compensated for it. So it's not like you exploited them. You didn't exploit your teacher. Although I, I will say, if you had a great teacher... I say this often, if you had a great teacher when you were a kid and, and you think that, and, and you justifiably believe that she had a great, a, a real impact on who you turned out to be and the choices you made on exposing you to ideas you wouldn't have had, then write them a letter, you know, uh, uh, and if you're rich, send them a check, uh, you know, express your gratitude and, and that's an act of justice. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take pride in your own achievements. It's just an expression of justice to thank the people who, who helped you along the way. There's nothing... Nothing wrong about that. Nothing that diminishes you about other people helping you to the contrary. Um, okay, let's take one more kind of wide issue. And then there's questions, unsurprisingly, about response to the pandemic and so on. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. But what the last kind of wider question, which is about thinking, if we had capitalism, full capitalism, or if we're moving in that direction, what would it look like 50, 100 years from now, and in particular, would it look like that there would be a massive concentration of power in a few hands and most people not doing much and sort of useless? And you might even think, I mean, part of the question might be, it's, isn't where, are we already moving in that direction with the Facebook and Google and so on, having so much power in so few hands and everybody else is sort of powerless and soon to be useless and yeah. not like not needed. Yeah, and, and this is a big issue, and, and you see it articulated by people on the left, people on the right, libertarians, I, I mean, really throughout the, throughout the whole political spectrum, this idea that robots are going to take our jobs, um, the return for, uh, you know, monopolies are going to dominate, and the return for certain types of skills are going to be massive, and the return on all other skills are basically going to be zero, and since robots are taking our jobs, and then... Uh, uh, you're going to be, in a sense, there's going to be nothing to do. Um, and and well, Disney had a movie, uh, you know, a cartoon movie about that, the little robot and everybody's, everybody just sits in a chair and eats and drinks all day because they don't have to do anything because the robots are producing everything. And it's, um, so this is not a new idea. And indeed, this idea that technology reduces the amount of jobs and that technology causes a massive concentration of wealth and everybody stays poor and they're, is an old idea. It's an idea that goes back to the 19th century. It's an idea that that uh, at least one part of it, the concentration of wealth, gets uh, thoroughly articulated by Karl Marx, um, and he he predicts a certain path for human. You know, where all the wealth is concentrated in a few hands. He basically makes exactly the same prediction that the that people like Thomas Piketty and others are making today. Um, so, and of course, the Luddites and and the anti-technologists starting in the late 18th century 
were predicting that technology would create these two classes where almost all of us, and, and the facts, the historical facts, the empirical historical facts suggest the exact opposite. That is that technology creates more jobs than it destroys, always, everywhere. And the, just think about the number of people working in productive jobs today. And let's take out a productive subsistent farming, because that's not really productive. So subsistent farming is how most of us lived 300, 400 years ago. We grew food and we ate it. So productive job is where you, you produce something and you trade, where you're actually uh, inc creating wealth in a sense. You, 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 you're trading with others because you've cre you, and you're creating what economists call the surplus. We're creating, you, you, you're raising your standard of living over time. Um, technology, uh, the number of people today working in such productive jobs is in the billions. The entire human population 120 years ago was less than a billion. And today working, number of people working in productive jobs is in the billions. And you get a sense that there's no end to the number of jobs that are gonna be out there. And there is no end. Human needs, human wants, human desires are infinite. And unless you're a science fiction writer and a good one at that, it's hard to imagine what the jobs of the future are going to be. It's hard to imagine what people are actually gonna do in the future. I don't know. I mean, I couldn't imagine. That literally, I can't remember the number, but it's 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 close to a million people, something like that, work today in the gaming industry. And some people get paid to play games online. I mean, that's just bizarre to me, right? Because I'm from a different generation. Most of you think gaming is just, well, it's always been here. It's just, it's just so the kind of industries, the kind of jobs, the kind of work is you know, it's hard to imagine, but every fact that we know about human nature and about the world out there suggests that technology creates more jobs. And the fact is that technology makes possible productivity for the least able. So somebody who can do math very well, let's say for cognitive reason, not because of, suddenly can use a calculator and then can use a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets are not that hard to use. And they can do very complicated math without really knowing anything about the underlying math because the spreadsheet's doing the work for them. And suddenly they are a million times more productive than they were before there was a spreadsheet. So technology actually enhances the productivity of the least able. Enhances the productivity of those who can't program the computer but can actually use it. Almost everybody can use a computer. So I think it's the exact opposite. I, you know, and, and there's no doubt in my mind, and you can, again, you can, you've got, we've got tons of empirical evidence that what capitalism does is it raises the standard of living quality of life of everybody. Now, are some people are gonna be super rich and how super rich are they gonna be in capitalism? Yes, they're gonna be people who are super rich. How super rich? I don't know. And I don't care. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates would be richer than he is under real capitalism. Maybe he wouldn't. Maybe he'd have more competition because uh, without regulations, they'd be more competitors and that would drive down his profit margin. Hard to tell, but it doesn't matter. The point is that whatever the outcome is, it's an outcome based on freedom, based on voluntary interaction, based on trade. So capitalism, if we had capitalism 100 years from now, I don't know what it looks like in that kind of detail. What I do, what I can tell you is that everybody, everybody who's living under that system a hundred years from now is thousands of times better off than they are today in every dimension of their lives. That some people are dramatically wealthier than others is absolutely true. But if they've lived under capitalism for a hundred years, nobody cares. But everybody in that society, except those who refuse to use their minds, everybody in that society is better off. The, the people who refuse to use their minds, what I always refer to as the wife beating drunk, is probably worse off. But then why do we care? We you certainly shouldn't care about structuring a society around the wife beating drunk's well-being. We should focus it on the well-being of those who are willing to use their minds. And they are thousands of times better off than 
than we are today. Uh, okay, let's try to take two questions about um, the current situation. And I'll, I mean, I'm condensing, but there have been a few more than two questions. So condense them into two. Um, so one about thinking about markets and one about government. So on the markets, people are going into stores and there's nothing on the shelves, particularly like hand sanitizer, or paper towel, or, uh, toilet paper. Do you think it would be worse or better if we had, we were closer to a free market? That's one. And then in terms of government, thinking of a, um, of a proper government, what sh should its powers be in the, in the case of a pandemic like this? So if I'm allowed to plug my show, I, my plan is to do a whole show tomorrow on what government, what, what, capital, what pandemics look like under capitalism. So, cause I think there's a lot to say about that. So, but broadly here, I would say to the second question first is that the role of government is the same in a pandemic as, a, as it is in everything else. The role of government is the protection of individual rights. And there is a role here because if I have a, uh, a virus or a disease that clearly is life threatening or a significant, represent a significant health threat towards other people, then the government's job is to prevent me from infecting those other people. So I, I'll give you an example, it just infuriates me because everybody's so blase about it. There was a guy the other day who flew on a jet blue plane. And as he got off the plane, I guess he told the flight attendant, or the, or the, hey, I've got coronavirus. Now, in a proper world, that guy would be in jail in five minutes, right? He would be quarantined, but more than that, he would be, I think, at a criminal prosecution for endangering other people. And potentially, if other people got the disease, uh, liable for the cost of treating them, and if anybody died, liable for manslaughter. So a, a, a proper government would take those kind of things super seriously, right? It, it would, it would, it would, um, it, it would, once somebody is identified with having the disease, it would insist on them being isolated and quarantined. And of course, because borders do matter, one of the things that it would be doing is, is in assessing people entry into the country, one of the qualifications would be, are you carrying an infectious disease? And it, you know, it, it's completely legitimate for a country to be checking people as they enter the country of whether they're carrying an infectious disease. And if they are either quarantine them or send them back where they came from. Um, so it's, 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 that's part of what a government would do. Um, so in a true laissez-faire capitalist economy, I think that that is really all it would do, including all, all that's necessary to make that possible, which is not trivial. Now, I think in the world in which we live in today, which is not ideal, and where the government has all these, is, a, has all these, is involved in so much of our lives already, it can't only do that. When 50, 60% of the healthcare system is controlled by the government, it can't say, well, we're gonna let the market deal with that. Be, you know, we're not gonna be involved. It has to be much more engaged in the world today than it would be under a, a purely capitalist system. And that would include things that haven't been done well, today, like, like, you know, facilitating the, the, the testing, like um, uh, making sure there are enough beds, uh, hospital beds, making sure there are enough hospital supplies and all of that. And let me just say about the supermarkets, things would be uh, better, much better in a free market uh, for a variety of reasons, because I think, I think if we were in a free market, people would be more rational. I think the gov, you know, the, the way the government has dealt with this has encouraged this kind of uh, behavior. I think that businessmen would have been given ha had more expectation. Uh, we price gouging would have kicked in, which would which would have moderated uh, people uh, hoarding stuff. So there were a lot of mechanisms that, in a free market, would have dealt with this. And of course. It, people could have people could have immediately asked people to go paid people to go in overtime. You you can't do that. They all kind of labor laws. There's so many ways in which production is restricted today, and you can't, as an emergency situation, just ramp up production as a one time thing. Uh, that in a totally free market, there would be a lot lot fewer shortages than there are today.
Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining us at Ayn Rand Con Live. I'm going to be joined in just a moment by my colleagues, Yaron Brook and Ankar Gatte. And we're now uh, going to try to make a dent in the long list of questions that we have in this general Q&A panel. Uh, let's turn to the question period. We have a lot of questions. And I, I, I cut you off, Yaron, about you wanted to add a few thoughts. Or you, 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 well, you were talking just, about. I wanted to add anything yeah. to the previous question. Okay, let's go. Do, let's do that. The wall. Yeah. yeah, I would say on the on the first aspect of it about government power, I think one of the things. So I I agree for sure that in when we're you're dealing with infectious disease, that's e. I mean, and here it's easily transmittable. To, that there's a role um, for government to protect people's rights and so to quarantine, isolate, and so. But I do think one has to also think about this issue and not downplay its importance, which is how the government's going to do it. And particularly what, um, how the decision-making works to wield this power. So part of the separation of powers is to create a system of government where the, the government's checking itself. And the, the less there is of that, or the more it's decayed, the more any kind of power, even legitimate power, it's wielded, it can be wielded in all kinds of bad ways, and there's no check. So uh, this is like for the war power, government should have the power of war. But if Congress completely cedes to the um, executive branch, you decide we were supposed to declare war, but now that never happens. It's all, all the powers in the executive branch. It can be easily abused. Um, and the same to declare a pandemic. I think Congress should have a role in it and they should be checking each other and disputes the Supreme Court would resolve so that like you can't have a pandemic that's going to, I mean, likely last two years and they're wielding this power. To, and we, you saw after 9-11 again, seizing emergency powers that they never give up. And you have to really be sensitive to, yeah, that happens, that they take power and never give it up. And what are the checks and balances to make that this this power will be wielded objectively, not non-objectively. <clears throat> I was just one quick thought about that. So that you, you mentioned the idea of wielding power or so seizing power and then not giving it up. I mean, that's an established pattern. And one of the things I, this, I one of the things I think is really concerning now is that it this is the, the mechanism by which government grows in significant ways when people are really afraid and they see government as sort of the savior in and it, it's you know it happens in wartime but now it's i mean i think it's there's really cause for concern because of people's attitude towards government so the kind of culture that we have and the attitudes people have towards government which is tell us what to do you know should we wash our hands should we not wash our hands and it's, it's as if you aren't a responsible adult so it, it's, it's heightened, I think, by the context of this situation where there's limited knowledge, there isn't really acknowledgement of what is going on. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, notice the lack of outrage for the massive, you know, uh, uh, violation of individual rights that's going on right now. I mean, the state of California is just taking, over, taking hotels and motels, right? To hell with private property. We're going to use this to quarantine people, and 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 uh, you know you'd think this would be anti the constitution, but uh, or or we're going to just cancel events, right? We're just going to tell you you have to cancel events. Why can't I decide to cancel events, or the attendees decide not to come to my events? So okay, no, the government has to decide no more events beyond a certain. All of these things are massive violation of rights, confiscation of private property, and nobody is outraged because it's in the name of emergency. And notice all these governors, they'll have one case and they're announcing emergency powers in every, almost every state in the union. And what that, what are emergency powers? They're the power now to violate rights on a scale that normally they couldn't. And, uh, and, and then nobody will question and nobody is questioned. I mean, look at what's happening in Italy, which is truly, you know, stunning, you know, what they've managed to do in Italy. And, and compare it, for example, to a more rational government whether by accident or, or uh, you know, planned, which is the South Korean response, which has been much more rational and uh, much less rights violating. And they're in much better situation. The model is the practical, much better situation than Italy or the United States or, or any of these other countries. Okay. 
see so line any uh, next question yeah so should we to switch a little to uh, what a directly moral issue so this is uh, from daniel watching on zoom uh, philadelphia attendee appreciate you coming to the online version so I'll, I'll read this question and you guys take a stab at it. Uh, how does one integrate one's history of immorality in the past to one's current state of self-esteem, uh, i.e. Uh, dealing with guilt? And then there's a related question. Uh, how should we relate to others' past immorality in judging their current character? And, then, and there's a third part. But why don't we take those two elements and I'll, I'll see if we can fit in the follow-up. Um, I'll take the... well. So one distinction that one has to make at the outset, I think, is this. There's such a thing as earned guilt and such a thing as unearned guilt. And it's particularly relevant when one's thinking about morality and what we were talking, what we were talking about for the last three hours. If, if it's true that the conventional morality is wrong, then it's going to make you feel guilty for all kinds of things that you should not feel guilty for. Um, so if it's telling you pursuing your own life and happiness and career and being concerned with your loved ones and not with your enemies, if that's evil, then if you're doing that, you should feel guilty for it. And if you're now starting to question that moral view, you can think about your past, like I felt guilty a lot. So, and you have to think, yeah, but maybe for most of it, I shouldn't have felt guilty. And so it, it's relevant. I think you should think about your history and because it's what forms your character. So you should think of what's forming my character. But you have to be open to the possibility, particularly if you're changing your moral views, to think, okay, I've been evaluating myself as guilty for that, but I actually it should, I should think of that as something good about myself. And much of Atlas Shrugged, the story, revolves around this, of people condemning themselves for what in fact on a better morality, or let's put it just on what Ayn Rand thinks of as a better morality, they should think of themselves as not just not guilty, but good for what I've done. So a lot of the business people beat themselves up for their virtues. So that that's one thing that is very important. And then on the second, if you now still think there's things in your past, it's uh, that I were wrong and I made bad choices and I should not have done that, the you only live in the present and extending into the future there's nothing you can do about the past but in the present you can make amends for instance of the people you think that you wrong or that you hurt or if it's just directed towards yourself that it was i was lazy and i didn't put a lot of effort in and i never tried to build a career so you haven't really hurt anybody else you've hurt yourself it's what am i doing now and to the extent it might be hard but am I trying to get into a better path to get a job that I like and not resent um, and try to have more constructive relationships at work instead of trying to sabotage myself and everybody else? It's and it's you have to evaluate yourself of what am I doing in the present? But that includes am I making corrections and amending things I've done wrong in the past? And to the extent you can, I think you should try to do it. Yeah, and I think that that same methodology applies to judging other people, although they you you know less about them, you know less about the processes in their own mind. But if somebody you know has done bad stuff in the past that is objectively bad, that is truly bad, then have they recognized that? Have they apologized for it? Have they done anything to compensate if there was damages? Um, and are they on a, a, a proper path? So people can redeem themselves. Not everything is redeemable, but most things are redeemable. They can redeem themselves, but that requires them to initiate it and to actually engage in activities that shows that it's genuine and that they won't do it again. Because to the extent, let's say they did it to you, it is dangerous for you to deal with somebody who does harm to you, unless you are now convinced that they won't do that harm again to you. Again, be selfish. So uh, you have to you have to have enough evidence that they are on the right path, that they understood their mistakes and they will are committed to not doing them again or in order to, to, to be willing to re-engage with them or to forgive them. Yeah, and I think that actually covers the third element which I didn't raise, but so that was the issue of forgiveness. So there's a place for it, but there are certain conditions that have to be met. Um, um, Alon, can we take one question that came up in yours um, that I think it would be good to address? Yeah. Uh, which was, 
what's the difference between self-interest and rational self-interest? You can start on that, Ilan, if you want. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a quick uh, response to that. I mean, the, the broad category in philosophy is, I mean, it's an answer to the question of who is the beneficiary of your action? And the egoism or self-interest means you are the beneficiary of your actions, but that doesn't tell you how you achieve values. It doesn't tell you how to identify them. And it doesn't really give you what Ayn Rand's theory gives you. So, so the, the addition of saying it's rational self-interest, it's identifying that there's a, a kind of a, um, a principle that you need to follow to, to identify your interests and, and figure out how to be the beneficiary of your actions. What are actually things in your interest? What will benefit you? Um, and this is in contrast with, I mean, there are other theories of egoism and the other theories, some of them will say it's, you have to, um, you know, find things that make you feel good. And that's what it means to, to be uh, egoist. And, and then there are still other theories that say, well, it's automatic. We're all essentially through our psychology, we're all basically egoistic. So the contrast is, I, the way I understand it is, adding the, the modifier rational is to point out that it's a matter of choice and that you need to think about how to accomplish your interests. Um, so I hope that's a good start for, I hope you agree with that. <laughs> uh, do you wanna add anything to this? Okay, okay. so I, I wanted to flag a quick question. This came up in your, it's in response to your talk on car. And I think it's worth just uh, two parts to it. Number one, uh, you referenced a book in your presentation that has a foreword by Bill Gates. So what is the title and who's the author? Just so people who are interested could look up that resource um the so the author is peter singer who's a professor of philosophy and it's um i always get it's famine affluence and morality i think yeah um, but it might be affluence famine and morale but if you search peter singer and famine you'll find it on amazon okay um, and then part two um this i think has generally just uh which of rand's essays would you recommend to get the most in-depth reflection of her moral thinking? Well, to get the in-depth, it's the lead essay in The Virtue of Selfishness. So that's her nonfiction book that's essays on morality. And the lead essay is The Objectivist Ethics. And there she presents the, the structure of her ethics and its basic principles and the argument for them, but it's a difficult essay. So, because what she's doing is presenting her system of ethics, how to think about it, what's radically new and different in it. it it's there that she's making the connection that, that the whole, why do we need a morality? Where do values come from? So it's dealing with the fundamental foundational issues. If you want to get your toe wet, there's other things to read. So. Um, there's other essays in that book uh, that you, on particular issues about, for instance, about moral judgment. Um, uh, and she calls it one of the essays, the cult of moral grayness that people say you can't, there's no such thing as black and white. There's only shades of gray in the, and she doesn't think that is true. So there's a lot of things you can get to get your toes wet. One of, one of them is there's a, in, I think it's in the voice of reason the, the essay, who is the final authority in ethics? And this deals now, again, in a pretty sophisticated way, but it deals with the common question. Well, if there is no God, who decides what's right and wrong? Where does morality come from? And, and she thinks that this is it. The whole question is completely wrong. Um, so and that is a lead. You'll start to get some of her view. But if you want really the in-depth one and want to read one thing, it's the objectivist ethics. Yeah, and I will just say quickly for those of you who are interested in getting that, obviously you can find it in The Virtue of Selfishness, which you can buy everywhere books are sold. But on our website, on aynrand.org, you can find both the objectivist ethics and um, who is the final authority in ethics, which is a related one. And I think as well, The Cult of Moral Grayness. Um, pretty sure that's online too. Okay, so let's turn to some more questions. 
Okay, how about this one um, from Stephanie on Zoom? If this morality of self-sacrifice that we've been talking about today is considered quote unquote unquestionable, how do you suggest the question be raised so that it doesn't get shut down? Uh, in other words, so that the rational approach can be communicated. Um, yeah, I, I can say a few things and then someone else can say some more. Um, so I would say two things. One is to ask the question that Ayn Rand says you should ask, which is, why is that the good? Um, by what standard and where do you get this standard? So if it is, it's, it's about sacrifice and giving up, it's, it, like why? Why is that what morality is about? Who decided that? Who determines that? What's the argument for it? And um, you will get r responses to that. And so the second part of my answer is, there's no easy way to this. It, this is the, it's the most difficult issue for somebody to question because you don't meet someone, leave aside a very young child who doesn't have moral views. Part of the moral views is what I put in my presentation that you can't think about moral questions. It's about your feelings, your emotions. So when you say like, why and what's the argument, the pushback will be, you don't need an argument. Don't you feel this? And if you say no, or if you even just say, I'm starting to question this, I'm starting to wonder about it. You, the response is that's evil. Um, and from a certain perspective, it is evil. From their, the, the conventional moralities, you're not supposed to question this. You're not supposed to have doubts. It's the same when you're doubting religion. It's one of the main things that comes is, you're not supposed to ask questions, stop asking. This is a common thing for young kids when they start asking questions. Stop already. Stop thinking about it. It's you're supposed to believe. You're supposed to accept. Don't you feel it? And then if you're asked, well, no, I don't. There's something wrong with you. Um, so to have the intellectual and moral courage to question this, you have to stand outside of it. But to stand outside of the good is to be evil. And you will be, and I mean, you can take Ayn Rand as a lightning. Why is she a lightning rod of so much criticism? Because she's saying, look, what everybody thinks is good is evil. And the response is, that's evil, what you're saying. If you're questioning what's good, you have to be on the side of evil. And that, there's no getting around that. So there's, it's, you, there's things you can do to try to encourage people to ask questions, but you have to be sensitive to the fact that the culture for, for in, this, in a sense, logical regions pushes the person to think, no, I should not be asking questions. That's evil. All right, let me throw another question at you guys. This is from uh, someone who is anonymous on Zoom. Uh, doesn't duty make people follow rules and therefore maintain the social structure? So in effect, a challenge to some of the views raised. Why is maintaining the social structure a value? I mean, what social structure? You know, the, the communists followed rules and there was a social structure in communism that entailed tens of millions of people dying. It was a structure. It's like people who say, oh, we shouldn't do that because it'll increase instability. Well, who said stability is a value? What does stability mean? In what context? Where is stability in the Middle East a value? Is stability in the Midwest a value? I mean, it, these are all thrown out there as if we should all accept them as that the structure is important. Some structures are awful. The, the structure of the Catholic Church, the structure of communism, the structure of fascism, and I would argue the structure of a mixed economy. And beyond that, what is, even if you could argue that somehow Everybody playing their little bits, you know, reduces violence and our lives are somehow marginally better, which you can't, but let's say, well, what about their lives? <laughs> you know, what about the people who are following duty? Their lives are not better. Their lives are miserable. And, and uh, they now you, you're basically treating them as cogs in a machine. We, we want the social stability. So we're, we're treating you like a little cog and you have to follow these duties so that the, the machine can function. It's a completely collectivistic, uh, anti-individualistic view of the world. And, of, and it places a value in something that in and of itself 
independent of what the structure actually is, um, is, is not a value, is, is actually can very well be an anti-value, which is stability or structure. Okay, I've got another question for you. Um, on, so we've talked a bit about, quite a lot about altruism and Luke on YouTube is asking uh, what I think is a, I mean, I think it's a tough question. So uh, can you explain why if altruism is bad, why did it last as a philosophy for so long? And you could even amplify that, I would say by saying, and it's hold on people is so strong. And how does that work? I mean, I'll say, so part of it, the, the previous, or I guess it's two questions ago now, is relevant. How hard it is to question this is really relevant for how it endures. Um, but it's the, if you know about the history of the West, Christianity had to stamp out the ancient world and particularly stamp it out or take it over intellectually. So it's not true that um, throughout the whole history of the West, it's been saturated with altruism. And particularly the ancient Greek period, which is the period of the most astonishing intellectual and cultural progress. If you see from where the Greeks started, um, before, I mean, about seven, eight century BC to where they end up in a few hundred years, it's a just, it's unbelievable when, if you know anything about that. And it's, if you read about the culture and read some primary things, um, sources about it, whether it's some, go to some of the plays, so, it, this is not a culture that is saturated in altruism. Um, and indeed, I think much of what Christianity teaches, if you told an ancient Greek, love your enemy, he would think you're crazy. I mean, I really, he would think you're crazy. Um, and should be checked into a mental institution. So it's, it comes to dominate, but that's, it comes to dominate because the supernatural view of the world comes to dominate. And then it's the whole, you're subordinate to a whole other realm and a whole other power. And when that wanes, altruism wanes. So it's true that it, in terms of explicit doctrines, this is what's preached in morality. But in the wider culture, there are forces that push against it. And it's the result of the, from the Renaissance onward. But what the Renaissance was, was rediscovering the ancient world and finding, oh no, Christianity is not the only way to look at the world. And the rediscovery of reason gave people self-confidence to think for themselves and to value their own minds in a certain way. And once you start to get that, people take altruism less seriously. And it was on its way out. So the fact I brought up in my talk, Mill and Kant, and I said they're 19th century, they're resurrecting altruism, but they're resurrecting it because it's being pushed out. And Kant's explicit about this. I'm here to save religion and particularly the religious ethics because it's going to lose. Um, and unfortunately, he saves it, but that's a complicated philosophical issue of why nobody could answer Kant. And so everybody thought, yeah, he's shown that reason has nothing to do with morality and morality is about commandments from some beyond. We don't know what beyond, it's called the Numenor world, but it's like, we don't know what it is, but I guess that's where it comes from and so on. And that, but it was saved. So it was on its way out. So it's not just, it's always there um, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, and, and that the alternative is such an achievement, right? That, that, that coming up with a moral code that is consistent with human nature, that actually can answer the challenges of Kant and the other philosophers and, and can complete what started in the Enlightenment um, is, is not easy. And it's, it's really, really a, a massive achievement. And this is part of the genius of Ayn Rand is that they, they weren't other philosophers who did this. They, they, maybe there's some who tried at the edges, but nobody actually could create a system that actually presented an alternative to altruism, an alternative that people could actually live, and an alternative that didn't involve sacrificing others to self, for example, but that actually uh, uh, 
she took self-interest seriously from a philosophical perspective and from the perspective of human life. So I think it's that combination of the difficulty in giving up religion and, and the, 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 the ability of philosophers kind of to secularize these ideas and then just a monumental achievement that is uh, objectivism and the, the difficulty in having somebody come up with that monumental achievement. Now it's up to us to, to put it into place, to, to, to saturate the culture with an alternative to altruism. All right, I, I have a number of questions still I would love to get through. So let me try to, um, I know it's always hard, but let's try to give slightly shorter answers so we have more time. Uh, I know you always bristle at that, Your Honor, it's okay. Um, Okay, question from Ayan on Facebook. Um, I'm just gonna summarize a portion of it, but aren't certain uh, key things like food, shelter, security, a sense of belonging prerequisites for self-esteem? And if, you, if you're lacking in some of these, imagine someone who's desperately poor uh, and fundamental resources, how can you actually achieve self-esteem? So isn't there like a precondition of, uh, that is relevant here? No, so all of those things have to be produced. None of those things is just a given. None of those things is supplied by reality for us. And it's indeed the achievement of those things that is what leads to self-esteem. And this is true of a poor kid and a rich kid. It doesn't matter. That is, let's say you're born rich. And yeah, it's all around you. But if you don't actually engage your mind and create something and, and gain the certainty that you could build it even if your parent didn't give it to you. You could produce the wealth even if it, you didn't inherit it. You, could, you, you are going to produce wealth in, for yourself. Then you're not going to have the self-esteem. And, and of course, a poor kid who doesn't have it, by creating, by building, by educating himself, by, by getting a job, by making a, a living, by putting food on the table, they are gaining the self-esteem. So it's true for every human being that they must experience the idea that they are competent to put the food on the table and to put a roof above their head in order for them to gain the self-esteem. It's a prerequisite for everybody, no matter what your starting point is. Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to put together two questions. Um, one is from Gerardo on Zoom and the other one is uh, from oh, sorry, Alec. Both from Zoom. So the, the two questions are basically, I think, in response to the, our presentations, why are we in the, in this conference equating religion with irrationality? And then, sort of the the related question from another uh, person is, um, of all the religions out there, isn't aren't there some that are more sort of self oriented, more re, so more rational, more life oriented? So do you guys want to take those two parts? Um. So the second, I, I think there are interpretations of a religion that can be uh, more or less hostile to human life. Uh, and, I mean, that's just Christianity. There's so many sects and within the sects, you have to like, how do they actually interpret and what do they take seriously of this and what don't they? But I think it's, when you're talking about in a modern period, all of this, it's because of outside forces. It's, so the reason Christianity does not look the way it looked in the Middle Ages is you had the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and you have the rediscovery of all the ancient learning, and then you have it going beyond that, the discovery, modern science, Galileo, Newton, and so on. And it's yeah, well, our text told us the world's created in seven days and the earth's at the same. Are we going to stick to this? And the, the Enlightenment's pushing, no, be rational. And some people try to make um, a, a kind of truce. Okay, yeah, we'll be rational about this kind of stuff, but let us th still believe that if I eat this cookie, that's the body of Christ and so on. And then it's a, well, that's stupid. So we won't, wait. and it, and it's, so they can start to look like it gets better, but it's not getting better qua religion. It's getting better because outside forces are neutralizing it. Really. I think that's what happened. Now that when you go into the, like the early origins of philosophy, uh, religion, it's different because they don't know any better, but that's not the modern context where you have so much, rational, secular knowledge. 
And why do we create religion with irrationality? Because religion is based on the negation of rationality in, in some scope of life, to, you know, different, different religions, different periods of time, just as Ankar said, uh, you know, it, that scope of life might be everything. So follow the book, even if the book says the, the, the sun goes around the earth, right, up to, you know, the Catholic Church through Galileo. Um, to today, we follow the book only in these things, right? The things that we decided you should follow the book. But in whatever it is, it's the negation of reality, the negation of evidence, the negation of your senses, negation of thought. Whatever it is, it, re it is requiring faith, which is the opposite of reason. It's requiring you to submit to authority over your own thinking mind in whatever scope your particular religion applies it to. But religion, qua religion, is always anti-reason and anti-reality, anti-fact.